Thank you. I don't know about you, I was uh, blown away for most of the day by the uh, power and the ubiquity of computers. Not only the fantastic graphics that we've seen, but to even recognize that musicians these days have a stage filled with computers as part of their performance uh, was to me very surprising. I want to uh, reduce the essence of computers down to their smallest working part for the purpose of talking about a resource, a resource that may be useful for increasing the speed of computers, and one which, interestingly, is not used today. It's a resource that lives inside of atoms, and it's one that we hope to develop as time goes on. This picture is the working part of every computer. It's the transistor. It's made out of a semiconductor. A semiconductor is something that's either a conductor or an insulator, depending on whether a voltage is applied to it. The fact that you can control electricity with electricity means that you can make a machine that can compute. As we've heard today, these are getting smaller and smaller, and in fact are approaching the atomic scale. Only a few hundred or thousand atoms across constitutes the wires that are inside of these computers that are around us. This little device invented in 1947 is now everywhere. Right now, we manufacture about 10 billion transistors every second. Most of you probably have 100 million or so transistors in your pocket right now. We live in a world filled with these little objects. But I would like to contrast the way these objects work with the world of atoms that Don was just talking about in the previous talk. Let's think of these transistors as being little switches. As I said, they are switches that can be turned on and off with electricity, but for all intents and purposes, they're on-off switches. We can call them zeros and ones if we like this binary notation. Or if we're interested in eventually moving to spins, which we'll do in this talk, we can think of them as uh, spinning this way or spinning the other way, up or down. But in any case, they represent some binary structure. The resource that I'd like to talk about, the one that's not used in computation, but which lives inside of every atom and makes the world around us work, is quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics says that that switch can be up and down at the same time, just like the particle that can go through two slits or any other quantum state. A transistor can be on and off, according to the laws of quantum mechanics. What that means is that you could imagine a machine that's uh, consistent with all the laws of physics, in which every one of those 10 million, 100 million transistors in your pocket was simultaneously on and off. And not just those two states, but in fact, every one of the exponentially many states that could be formed by imagining every one being on or off, and every one that's on can then turn another one on or off, but of course it is either on or off, and it then either does or doesn't turn the next one on or off, etc. That power lives inside of the world that we understand of atoms, but we don't use it. And it's a strange world. In moving from the world of atoms to the world of macroscopic objects, we have to forego our intuition, and I'll give you an example of that. Take a helium atom, the same atom that's in, you know, helium balloons. The two electrons that form the shell of the helium atom have a particular orientation with respect to this spin that I talked about, the angular momentum, spinning up or spinning the other way. And that is that they're in some configuration of these two spins. Now what quantum mechanics allows, and I, and I should mention this, this quote of spooky action at a distance is something from Einstein who never quite bought this story of quantum mechanics and you'll see why in a second. Let's take the two electrons in the helium atom and for the language of the day I'll call them up and down. I won't say which one's up and which one's down. One of them's up and the other one's the opposite direction so that they can fill in the first shell. And I want to take those two electrons and without disturbing them separate them in space. 
And I want to uh, give one o o over here, the first seat here. If I can, do you mind if I toss you one of these electrons? You have to grab it, okay? Here you go, you got it? Got it, okay. And I need another one over here. Michael, can I, you, you help me out here? There's the second electron. Now, what I would like you to do, we didn't disturb the electrons, we distributed them very gently, you saw how I, is to measure yours, uh, is it up or down? It's up. Michael? Down. down. Oh, that was interesting, okay. They were, that's, that's right, because we didn't disturb them. Let's do it one more time, just for fun. Here you go. Got it? Michael? Good. And you're, wait, 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 I have an idea. Turn your detector sideways. Now, is it east or west? Michael, did you hear what he said? You're not listening, right? East. Michael, yours is? West. How did you know what his was? That's a resource. And that's what quantum mechanics provides. Quantum mechanics says that that singlet, the two electrons in the helium atom, if you could control them and even separate them, even separate them to the outer reaches of the galaxy, if you make a measurement, yours becomes the opposite. And that's a powerful kind of communication. Not quite enough to violate special relativity. Because immediately, as soon as he measured his, yours became something. And we don't use that in any machines that we build these days. And yet, there's little doubt that it's true. But imagine building some complicated machine, a bit like a cat or something, and saying that all of these things were together. Now, Schrodinger commented on the possibility of putting a cat like this together, and he said, we can even think of some quite ridiculous cases. Well, I'm not going to read the quote, but you understand what's going to happen. The, cat, the quantum state is going to either knock the cyanide bottle over, and it's going to either kill the cat, and the whole cat is going to either be alive or dead simultaneously. And Schrodinger illustrated this point to represent how impossible such a system was. But in fact, Schrodinger set us up on that one, because Schrodinger created a situation in which if you created the conditions to preserve the simultaneous superposition of all of these states, it would have certainly killed the cat. There wouldn't be any air in the room. It would be very low temperature. But computer chips are very happy to work under those conditions. And so there is no rule that says that we couldn't make a cat-like chip that would be very happy to work at absolute zero or near, in vacuum, et cetera. And what if we could? There are examples of problems. Scott Aronson told you a little bit about them earlier today. And I don't know whether Reeves was paying attention during that talk, but I, I want some help from Reeves on the first question on this test. Two prime numbers, <laughs> smallish, smallish prime numbers, <laughs> whose product is 15. Can you help me out? It depends on what you mean by prime. <laughs> <laughs> What's your definition of prime? I will say. exclude one for the sake of uh, brevity. Yeah. You wouldn't be the first person today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go with three. Yes. Five, my final answer. Fantastic. You did graduate high school. <laughs> I think I'm going to need Carl Feynman for this one. This one's a little bit harder. Carl, I don't know if you're here. Yeah? Do you really want to sit it's unfair. It's unfair. It's a hard question. The answer is 41 times 113. And what's interesting about the example is not only is it a hard question for Carl Feynman, it's a hard question even for computers. That is, if you take two numbers that are pretty big and multiply them together, that, that goes like a snap. But if you take the thing that you got when you multiplied them together and you try to break them apart, you're in real trouble. In fact, what I mean by real trouble is that if the numbers are a thousand bits long, 
it would take the age of the universe for even the best computer to solve the problem. Now, if you could build one of these machines that took advantage of the superposition, that let all the transistors in the circuit be in multiple states at the same time, it becomes a very easy problem. Our job, and by our I mean in my laboratory and the laboratory of several colleagues and friends who are here, we're trying to build these, these uh, chips and we're building them out of semiconductors, only in this case we're using the spin. We're doing the same kind of transformations where we separate the electrons to produce the same kind of entangled states. And how far are we? We have about one working. So maybe it's about the equivalent of 1947 when this was invented, the transistor. And we can see as we go along using either carbon nanotubes or gallium arsenide or silicon the kinds of machines that we had to build. And we're at the level now of one or two or on a good day three transistors. And we're waiting for the day that we have not a hundred billion, but the 300 that we heard about earlier that would produce an exponential number of quantum states and allow computation. We're not there yet. We're still building these chips. Here's a carbon nanotube with gates on it that produces one such spin-based quantum chip. And for the next one, and the next one, and the next 50, and the next 500 after that, we're going to have to wait a few more TED meetings. Thank you.